we have three uh, topics. The first one is techniques for left main PCI. I invite Dr. KK Haridas. Evolution and techniques to improve the long-term outcomes and reduce TLR in the left main. Uh, technique of left main stenting, uh, I'm not going to touch into the details, but I'll probably give you uh, some of my viewpoints. And what I'm basing my talk on is the experience of about 300 left mains. This is the registry. I'm not going into the details for want of time because we are already late. If you really see that majority of the lesions of the left main uh, occur, this is uh, an operator driven and we were doing mainly ostium and shafts in the yester years. We do more of distal left mains, almost 60, two thirds of the cases of left main stenting uh, are done and uh, the bifurcations rather than the ostium or maybe more than the shaft. Uh, this was the distribution of uh, some of the techniques that we used, and this is the follow-up results of the registry from the Amrita Institute. And what you see on the red, this strip is what was lost to follow-up. We had a 90-95% follow-up, which is pretty good for any, uh, you know, data. If you look at the current results of left main stenting with drug-eluting stents, no difference. <laughs> I'm sure Dr. Sethi has already gone through these uh, between surgery and angioplasty in terms of maze, death. The main difference comes in the TVR. Now, uh, we get on to the uh, seminal part of this lecture. I want to uh, emphasize on the fact that left main uh, is not just a left main, as Jeffrey Hartzler put it many, many years ago. About a uh, majority of the cases occur at the bifurcation and a very small number in the shaft and in the ostium. If you look at the um, you know, heterogeneity of left main stenosis, you will see that left main stenosis is often accompanied by single vessel disease, uh, two vessel disease or triple vessel disease. Only 10 to 15 percent of the cases are isolated left main. So we are dealing with a very, very complex uh, uh, problem and no two cases are identical. You have to plan your strategies and what I'm going to give you is some broad guidelines. Now, there is no question about the fact that uh, there is a much uh, a lower restenosis when it comes to ostium and the shaft lesions and very low need for a target vessel revascularization with excellent survival and long-term even free survival. Uh, especially with the you know, current use of drug eluding stents, we have so many papers on this and I don't need to dwell on this anymore and this is a single stent usage. Um, many of you would go with the belief that single stent is the best way to do a bifurcation with provisional stenting of the side branch. However, not many patients in bifurcation lesions can be addressed by just a sim single stent, and that's a major issue. Now, if you use a single stent, you can get away with excellent results in the main vessel and very low restenosis in the side branch, and the need for uh, and recurrent symptoms are lower and need for TLR or TVR is much uh, quite low. Uh, in the past, uh, distal left main lesions had a 20% restenosis with, and is it possible by technical advances, not by technology advances, technical advances to bring down this restenosis by a good performance of the procedure? And that's what I would be focusing at. You can see that uh, drug eluting stents certainly are superior to the bare metal stents. And uh, I just want to use one slide from the syntax study to tell that you need to select your cases very well before you do the procedures. If you have a low syntax score or a medium syntax score, you'll see that this is a stent arm, this is a surgical arm. You'd find that there is no difference uh, uh, in the 12-month maze. However, 
in the high syntax score group, you see a significant difference uh, favoring surgical outcomes. So first of all, if you need to get a good result on the left main, you have to use the syntax, the parsonet, or the euro scores. Um, the key to success in left main stenting is a good quality imaging and a good three-dimensional uh, sort of uh, understanding of the anatomy and the plaque distribution and the angulations of the bifurcation, proper patient and lesion selection, proper selection of the technique and strategy, and predilatation, uh, a prediction of the late outcome after the procedure so that you can take the necessary steps to correct it or improve upon your results. Simple techniques involve placing a single stent in the left main, like in this particular patient. You can see a shaft long lesion, and the circumflex was a less dominant uh, system. Obviously, we put one stent, and then we optimize with a balloon on the circumflex, and that was a good result in this patient. Uh, I can tell you, you have to believe me, that uh, has no restenosis. Now, uh, Often when you do the single stent techniques, the ostium of the left main is involved in more than uh, two-thirds of the patients, and you have to stretch the stent into the left LAD, um, uh, from the ostium to the LAD. And the size mismatch obviously is a real issue, and so you have to optimize the apposition of the stent and the dilatation of the stent in the left main uh, the proximal optimization techniques using uh, larger balloons and the way to do it if you don't have an intravascular ultrasound is to use this formula add up the diameters of the circumflex in the LAD and then divide it uh, two-thirds of this uh, would be the size of the balloon that you re require for a minimum uh, you know expansion of the stent and this is uh, a rough rule of the thumb this is uh, using the Murray's law so this is a very important point that you need to remember. Now, when you go for an elective two-stent technique of unprotected left mains, the question arises which technique to use. You have many techniques, a coulard, the crush, the T, the V, and so on and so forth, SKS, and then is there any evidence of preferring one over the other? That's a question that we are going to address. Which to choose in a given patient and how to perform each of these procedures. Now, some of the considerations I told you already is a plaque distribution, the angulation and the branching pattern, the dominance of each uh, of the branches, and so on and so forth. What is an optimal two-stent techniques? The, some of the theoretical considerations in this situation is that the, there is a complex transition of the left main stem into the two branches. You know, when you do an IVAS pullback, you see that there is a dumbbell appearance where the circumflex and the LAD has come out. You must have seen in many cases today. So the left main bifurcation is not a true geometrical circular vessel. It is actually... Uh, and a sort of oval shaped or dumbbell shaped or whatever it is. And there is a lot of anatomical dis distortion of the bifurcation. Some, what you think is a clean bifurcation, the angulation of the two branches may be you know, opposite to each other or in different angles. So we need to take this into consideration. And you need to make sure that there is no geographical miss of the carina and the lateral angles of the bifurcation. You need to make sure that the flow division uh, is covered by the stent strut so that the duct distribution in these uh, areas are even. So to date, there is no study which has actually defined an optimal stent uh, method or a, uh, a single method to say that this is the best method, either a culotte or a crush or whatever it is, we'll look at some of the data. Now, uh, so the main important aspects are the flow divider is always disease-free, and this is a common rule. When you do the IVAS, you will understand it better, especially when you pull back from the circumflex. 
The left main bifurcation is rarely focus, focal. It involves both the branches of the left main very often than not. And the osteal LAD and circumflex disease most commonly involves the left main in almost uh, a good number of patients. So even what you think is a pure osteal or a bang osteal lesion in the LAD actually is left main disease. It's much more extensive than what the angiography shows. These are some of the techniques. This is a wee stenting or a simultaneous kiss, uh, kissing technique. This is a culotte cool where actually you put a stent in the circumflex or reverse and then you go through the struts which are opened up on the outer curve and then put a stent into the left main. There is a dual metal uh, overlap in this region of the left main. This is a, a crush technique where the metal is actually crushed a little bit into the left main and this would be the T stent where you actually bring, uh, obviously these words are self-explanatory, I don't have to dwell on these more. Just to mention a few points of the crush technique, it's pretty safe, it's very quick and the ischemic time is very limited so you can do in some of the high risk patients. It reliably treats a side branch and always you're under control, even if you don't, you're not able to cross it, the immediate results are pretty good. But remember one thing, you have to end a crush technique with a kissing balloon dilatation, as Antonio Colombo showed us, and he's the one who has described this technique. That's the most important point. Uh, this is what happens actually, and today the crush has been modified uh, into a mini crush. You don't crush more than one or two struts in the left main to reduce the metal in the left main. And that's one way in which you can get a better result than a standard crush with uh, extensive amount of the circ stent uh, remaining in the left main. You can also do it the reverse way called the reverse crush, but it depends on the anatomy. Now, some of the tips for the T stenting is that you need to make sure there is no geographical miss at the ostium of the circumflex or the LAD, whichever you use as the limb of the T. And the other issue is you cannot prolapse too much of the stent into the uh, left main stent so that you can't, you jail the other vessel or you make it difficult to take your devices into the LAD. If you miss the ostium of the circumflex, you can predict a good restenosis. So that's the tip for the T standing. And one way to do it is to balloon position and optimize like what Dr. Baragan has shown. You inflate the balloon, pull back the circumflex stent so that the marker on the stent marker on the balloon proximal marker touches against the left main and then you deploy uh, the left main stent kept, uh, balloon kept at low pressures and then you deploy it so that you don't have a geographical mess and do a kissing balloon and always check with an IVUS. Now this is a patient who had a tandem stenosis in the LAD and the distal left main. You can see the anatomy in this view is much better seen and uh, single stent. Uh, there was a pinch of the circumflex. We had to do a T, open up this, do a T stenting and then we did an IVUS and this was, you know, there was excellent, there was no gap between the left main and the, uh, you know, stent in the circumflex. And we also went ahead and optimized the, you know, left main with a post dilatation. This was another patient who had a true bifurcation starting from the distal left main involving the proximal circ and the proximal LAD, very, very complex lesion. And you can see that this was one of the cases done in the last India Life. And uh, we did a crush. I thought crush was the best technique for this. And you can see how we do the crush. We keep both the stents in position after pre-dilatation. Then we uh, deploy the circumflex stent. You can see the waste coming off. And then take out everything including the wire so that you don't jail the wire. You don't actually entrap the wire between the two metals. It can be difficult to take it out. And then you deploy the stent, recross, and then you go ahead and do the, this is the way to do the crush. Uh, yeah. And finally you end up with a kissing balloon dilatation. And my philosophy is always make sure adequate length of the balloon covers 
this angle of the circumflex so that you can nicely, uh, you know, tack the plaque on that side, which is where the plaque uh, occurs in majority of the patients. Now, what about comparing these techniques, the culotte or the crush? You can see here, uh, this is a Nordic II study where they showed that the culotte is better than the crush technique in terms of TLR. But remember one thing, one of the big criticisms of the study has been that 40% of the patient, they could not access the side branch because the older generation stents and they could not do a final kissing dilatation. So remember, final kiss is mandatory. And these are some of the studies looking at various other uh, techniques and when they use a newer generation stents, Nordic 3 uh, shows that there's no difference in the TLR between the techniques. Here they showed that the SKSS is uh, inferior to the crush, but remember Samir, Samir Mehta has done over 2,000 SKSS with excellent results. So we, I do not believe that each, there are three different studies showing three different results, so we still don't have the final answer. This is the uh, importance of uh, a kissing dilatation. When you don't kiss, you have a higher uh, you know, event rate and higher maze. Now, the other important thing that I need to mention is intravascular and extravascular imaging before left main stenting. All of you would have uh, already seen a lot of IVAS being used in this workshop, and the IVAS can help you assess the lesion, uh, select a patient, select a technique, and appropriate device, and it can optimize the procedure to give you a good long-term result. This is an example of a borderline lesion by angiogram. Look at what's happening in the IVAS. A very fibrotic plaque occupying almost 70% of the diameter of the vessel. And the minimal lumen area was 4.2 millimeters, and anything less than 6, 7, uh, or less than 5, should be addressed in the left main. Seven is the criteria, now it was five earlier. It can also tell you the composition of the plaque to choose your strategy, whether you want to debulk it, whether you want to modify the plaque. Uh, fibrous fatty tissue is in yellow, fibrous tissue in green, and uh, hemorrhage and calcium in white. So that if you want to use a rotoblator or an angiosculpt and so on to modify the plaque to give you a better stent expansion, you can use these technologies. This is a patient who had a uh, closed off grafts. It was an unprotected post-CABG uh, situation where we had to heavy calcification in the left main. We had to use a rotoblator to open up the left main. Now, IVAS can be used and uh, can be technique specifically uh, used. This is a crush technique. You can see that the post tent you can see that before the kissing dilatation, the stent struts were, uh, you know, jailing the ostium of the circumflex, and which we had to go and do the kiss, and this struts moved out. And you can see a good lumen area in the LAD circumflex and the left main, which predicted uh, a good long-term result. This was a patient who had a long uh, lesion in the uh, left main, involving the ostium of the LAD, and you can see the IVAS image. Focus on the IVAS image. The rest of it is just routine angioplasty. Um, I need five more minutes. Five more minutes. Yeah. Uh, you can see that we are pulling back the IVAS from the LAD, and as you come, there's a little plaque at the distal edge of the stent, but the lumen was good, and then you can see the struts appearing, and the distal stent had a uh, area, lumen area of 7.4, which predicts an excellent uh, low restenosis, and the ostium of the LAD was heavily calcified. It was almost 7, which again was good, and you can see that we are coming into the left main at this point of time. The circumflex is open. You see the struts have moved away on a, after the kissing dilatation, and the stent, one strut is protruding into the aorta. This was uh, uh, you know, we didn't have to do anything to the stent. 
This is just to show you that IVAS guidance improves the results, long-term results after stenting. Su Jung Park has shown that. And these are the minimum. You get an area of above eight, you can predict a restenosis in the left main, even in bifurcations of uh, close to a 5%. Uh, the FFR, uh, again, has been used in left main stenting, uh, like in this particular patient. I want to uh, show you some data of FFR in left main. This is uh, where the lesion was angiographically less than 50%. Majority of them had a FFR of more than 8, 0.8. And in those who had 50 to 90%, you find the big scatter between normal FFR and abnormal FFR. So uh, at this point of time, probably we need to look into uh, uh, you know, how these are going to behave. So many of the lesions that may appear angiographically significant, if they have a normal FFR, uh, the data, the, we have data, but not robust enough to tell us that we probably can follow them up medically. FFR is an adjunct to an angiogram. Uh, the problem with FFR is downstream disease, like what now uh, Praveen Chandra showed, that calcific left main uh, LAD and uh, the downstream stent may make the FFR assessment erroneous. So if the patient is symptomatic or if he has a stress may be positive, I would go and stent the proximal lesion. The wires, especially with uh, the flow wires, can be stiff, but the pressure wires are soft. And the post-stent uh, reserve can take time to recover. They may, for the first six months, they may not recover. You're going to see the OCT. This is an unexpanded stent strut in the left main in the OCT at the ostium of the circumflex. So OCT, the problem with the OCT is don't interpret an OCT like an IVAS. Unlearn IVAS and learn OCT. You have to, there are two are different. In the OCT, what you see is the endoluminal aspect of the stent and what you see here is a shadow. Unlike the IVAS where you can see outside the stent, the uh, plaque. So, in OCT, we focus on the lumen, and in the IVAS, we focus on the ratio between the vessel uh, and the lumen. Uh, finally, this is my last but one slide. We also use in special situations in the left main uh, the CT angiogram. This was a totally occluded left main. You can see that we didn't know what was happening, and the collaterals to the circumflex and LAD were bad. So we did a CT angiogram which shows a nice distal vessel and we went and opened up and that was the final result after opening up a bifurcated total occlusion. The difficulty here was the wire directions in a total occlusion when you have a branch point. It was extremely difficult, but these decisions were made easy by an image, a CT image which helped us. So occasionally you have to use this. Ladies and gentlemen, some of the uh, thoughts that came random to me, choose the right case is one message I would like you to take home. In an elective double strength strategy, this, we do not know which is superior to each other, but each strategy needs individual uh, you know, uh, techniques. And you need to actually know the fineness, uh, finities of those techniques to optimize the results. The decision making of the technique is driven by the anatomy and to a large extent, intuition. Inexperience takes cover of protocols and techniques. Experience gives you an intuition and I'm sure all of you uh, would have developed that to some extent or other. Angio alone is inferior to angio plus intracoronary imaging, especially intravascular ultrasound. As of to date, maybe tomorrow it will change. It seems a moving target to assess the results of bifurcation stenting of left mains. And no single technique delivers the optimum result in all left main, uh, uh, you know, PCI. Thank you very much.